we've been talking about the economy and what's going on with the economy, sort of measuring it. We, I'm pretty sure I showed you this in the chapter 22. No, not this one. The next slide. Maybe. Okay, we saw something related, similar to this in chapter 22, but we're seeing something similar to it in here, and I'm not going to test you on either. Okay, but just, you know, what we spend our money on, I talked about a week or two ago, was, you know, it, it, on services, not goods, this is where a lot of our paycheck goes, you know, your cable bill, your power bill, your phone, cell phone bill, your internet bill, all those are services, you get $2 for a state, you pay $15 to that will be, that other 13 is a service. 60%. So that, that's kind of our spending. It was like 67%, I think, with services. But that was our spending. But I'm flipping this around to production. 60% of what we make in America is services. So 60% of what we make is services, but we buy 67% services. Guess what? We're buying services and spending them from somewhere else on the planet. 39% uh, of what we get is manufacturing, mining, construction stuff. Less than 1% of the production in the United States is agriculture. Less than 1% is agriculture. And this 1%, and I'm not just saying this because I'm running the agribusiness program here, but that 1% is kicking butt because that 1% is feeding the other 99% plus their own 1% and making extra to go elsewhere. That 1% is awesome. I was about to say, that That's sounds a little, like, small for it to be so Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's the miracle of, we've, got, we've been blessed with very good land overall, very good topography, climate, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's just, you know, it doesn't get super hot in the south of Texas and Florida. It doesn't get super cold up north until you get to Alaska and other way. You know, and just... A good chunk of our country has good land that we can do good stuff with. Yeah, we got the deserts out west. Yeah, okay, Alaska. Yeah, okay, Texas, New Mexico. <laughs> yep. there, there, yeah, but a lot of what, what we have is usable for agriculture compared to a lot of the rest of the planet. Yeah. I'm not going to Like, I was yeah. trying to do the beach the other day, and probably 20 miles going down the road was just Bean yep. farms. Yes. <laughs> Bean farms, farms, because they like the same kind of soil. Um, a lot of our ex tobacco farmers have gotten into doing soybeans now because the dirt and the tools and the equipment, a lot of it will transfer. Yeah, didn't they say, like, if you grow tobacco, the land will only last like five years and then it gets burned? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, they, yeah you have to do crop rotational and stuff. And a lot of times, Tobacco is kind of hard on the soil, so you get to the point you get the tobacco out and you put something else, even like clover or something like that, that will put nitrogen back into the soil and then you can come back. And, and that's a lot of your tobacco farmers will be rotating some kind of beans or some kind of legumes like that in there just to rotate. And it's not the tobacco industry as big as it used to be. Oh, no, it, bless you. Uh, the, yeah, but I'm trying not to go completely down this rabbit hole. But yeah, the tobacco. I'm not going to go there, but yeah, it's a lot smaller around here. The government kind of broke the tobacco industry a few years ago. Part of the tobacco settlement that some of you are getting money to come to college from. You know, so. Yay. But less than 1% of what we do is agriculture. Less than... It's less than 2% of our population lives on a farm. That's mom, dad, kids. So really, it's like less than... Maybe 1% of our population, not even 2% of our labor force, is doing agriculture. It's doing the farming. But agribusiness, job wise, and that kind of stuff, 20% of our jobs in America are attached to agribusiness. The people working at John Deere making the tractors, that's agribusiness. The people doing the programming to the computers who go on to John Deere tractors so the farmer can't repair it, so then they have to take it back to John Deere's dealership in order to do the <laughs> As I, the people were stocking themselves in food lion, when y'all food, food lion. I just said <laughs> so uh, but, but I mean, yeah, there's those jobs, but then there's the science jobs, doing the research, that kind of stuff, coming up with the new chemicals, pesticides, and all that kind of stuff. And then it just, if you're looking for a job, and guess what? Agriculture ain't going away because we all did. What happened if there was more than one 
other than American. And who are our number one and number two part customers? Customers. Canadian businesses and, Amer and Mexican businesses. Why? Because they're right there. It's closer. What gas station do you buy gas from? The gas station is close to your house or the one that's outside your, in southern New Richmond. All right? You do business with people that are close to you. Especially for things where there's not a material difference between it, like, you know, a tomato. Is Canada going to be buying tomatoes from us or buying them from Italy? And put them on a ship and have, them, have these tomatoes sailing across the ocean for three or four weeks? And then, no. That's true. It's cheaper. Yeah, no transportation costs are lower, and especially with well, it, it used to be NAFTA, which we, I think we've got that I'm not going to play. Y'all heard of NAFTA, right? NAFTA is dead. We now have U.S., Mexico, and Canada. That's the trick. Hey. The only way that I remember it is the first time I saw this acronym, I'm like, United States Marine Corps, what? <laughs> that's not what I was thinking, too. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I wanted to do. So, and this is, Hot Office of Press is like, what, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, that all this will sell is U.S., Mexico, Canada. <laughs> not to do with anybody else other than U.S., Mexico, Canada, or even after, but. I think that took his name a little too literally. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Um, so, our number one and number two customers who are buying stuff from us are Canada and Mexico. The Canadian and Canadian businesses, Mexican businesses. Right. Number three, China. We're going to talk more about that here in a couple minutes. Number three is China. Number four is Japan. Five is Germany. Six is the United Kingdom. That's England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland. At least Northern Ireland. Yeah, Northern Ireland. One of them is part of the UK, the other one isn't. I can't remember which. I'm pretty sure it's Northern Ireland. Okay, Canada and Mexico. They're close to us. Set it, put a pin in China. Talk about these countries. If I was to go down the list and add the next four or five countries in there, it would be like France, Italy, Spain. Why them? We talked about this two days ago. Income-wise, they're similar to us. Educational-wise, they're similar to us. Value-wise, they're similar to us. So it kind of makes sense that they're going to be buying the same kind of things that you and I buy, right? So, and consequently, we're going to be buying the same kind of things that they're buying. So we end up having a tighter relationship with when it comes to trade with a lot of those other countries like that that are economically similar to us, educationally similar to us. Plus it also helps that they actually have the money to be buying stuff from us because their per capita GDP is like 50 or close to ours. Their income, household incomes are similar to ours. They have two cars in the parking lot and a 16 type big screen TV in the house, just like we do. Where Haiti is kind of down, going to be way on down the list because they don't have the money to buy stuff. Yeah, they have the people and they would probably like to buy some of our stuff, but they don't have the money to do it, right? So, we're trading with people that are kind of similar to us. Okay, language is different, but you know, educationally, whatever. We trade with people close to us, and then we trade with China. We'll come back to that here. <laughs> There's all these people that are in there. And India, which I really need to give them a look. Now, we sold, let's go back a second. We sold $1.6 trillion worth of stuff. This is in 2014. Now it's over $2 trillion. Our economy is our $20 trillion, So we make $20 trillion worth of stuff and we sold two of it to somebody outside the United States. So a tenth of what we sell is to somebody outside the borders of the United States. But guess what? Probably 15% of what we why comes from somewhere outside the borders of the United States. So we're, we're losing. Our, we have a negative net export. Net export. Oh, the one thing I wanted to say to you, I forgot the percentage. Of all the exchanges throughout all the world, 
America is selling eight and a half percent of the stuff that is being exchanged internationally to our planet. Eight and a half percent. That's you think about the other couple hundred countries, and we're doing a ten, almost a tenth of the sales. We're doing almost 13% of the buying, though. This is what we do. And who do we buy from? Okay, so put a little asterisk for China. I'm going to talk, to that, talk about them in a minute. But we buy from our neighbors, and we buy from those other similar countries. Because of what we just talked about. Now let's talk about China here. Let's look at China's number. How much are we buying from them? Well, $167 billion worth of stuff. So we're buying almost $500 billion worth of stuff from China. Let me go back a slide. How much are they buying from us? Only 124. Okay. So we buy we buy 467. They buy 124. So they send us 467. Million billion dollars worth of stuff. We send them 124 billion dollars worth of stuff, but they're not going to say, "Well, we're going to give you 124, and you give us 467." No, let me flip it. We're going to cut and take two. They're not. If we say, "Well, you give us 467, we give you 124," what are they going to do? Yeah. Crap, no. Just in, oh. set everything else aside. If I walked up to you and said, "Hey," I'll give you $124 if you give me $467. What are you going to do? You're going to punch me or whatever. You're going to flip me off. You're going to whatever, slam the door in my face like Jenny always got victimized. Yeah, victimized. That was it. It would have been an accident, I promise. So, what is happening? We buy $467 of stuff. So, they send us four hundred sixty-seven billion dollars worth of stuff. They send us one hundred and twenty-four worth of stuff, and we've got to send them something else. We send them one twenty-four worth of stuff. What's it? Three, four, three. We've got to send them cash. What's left? What's left? And there's some problem. We give 343 of cash plus 124 worth of stuff is equal to the 467 of stuff that they give us. Because here's the thing. It gets complicated. Because we don't give them $343 billion worth of cash. Because they don't want it. Because they can't use it. Because if you are a worker in China, what kind of money do you want your boss to pay you with? Chinese yuan. If you are a worker here in America, what kind of money do you want your boss to pay you with? American dollars. The Chinese companies need yuan to pay their employees. They need yuan to pay their suppliers. They need yuan to bribe their government officials. The dollars are useful here not there. So this is where the things get run. So they've got, we're, we're, send us stuff, send us stuff. They're okay sending us stuff because they're, you know, it's creating child dollars. But then they're getting money back and they're like, well, what, we've got all these American dollars, well, what can we do with it? So they're like, well, okay, does anybody else out there need American dollars? Mm, okay, you know, France, you need some American dollars. Well, you give me some francs with American dollars. Or, and then we can use that device stuff that we can import from as part of the thinking. But guess what? Let me roll back. Canada. We buying 347 from them. Come on. Canada only buys 312 from us. Mexico buys 240 from us, but we buy 294 from them. Everybody, literally, just everybody that we do business with 
and so with leftover American dollars when the trade is over. Because there's almost nobody that we have a trade surplus with. We have a trade deficit with just about everybody. So now the Chinese government's like, okay, is there any country that needs extra American dollars because you want me to buy more American products? And the answer is no, we got extra, no, we got extra, no, we got it. So everybody's stuck with extra money that is really only useful here in the United States. So what can they do with these American dollars? Buy something. Buy more of our products. Well, guess what? They exactly. already bought all that they wanted. <laughs> they already bought all that they wanted in this leftover. What do you do if you have extra money after buying all that you want? <laughs> have any of you ever been there? This one, Congratulations, congratulations. What did y'all do with the extra money after buying everything you wanted? Put it away. Work hard. Just save it. Save. Savings. Savings. Invest. But later. Well, they can later. So here's what they do is those American dollars get used here in America. So they take this money and they invest it buying stocks in American companies. They invested buying land in America. They invested buying businesses in America. And it's a little bit kind of like found money in the couch cushions. Uh, Japan, trade surplus. Japan, land is expensive in Japan. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Land is not expensive where? Here in the United States. So what does a company like Toyota or Honda do? But well, we need to produce more cars to sell over the entire planet. Land's like, like expensive here in Japan, and we've got all these leftover American dollars that we don't know what to do with. Let's build a factory in America. So let's build a factory in America. Well, at least they're employing the American workers building the cars with the profit from those cars is going back to Japan. At least we got the jobs. But what's ended up happening is a lot of our businesses are slowly losing some ownership and control to foreign investors. Another place that they use this leftover money, who else in America besides, who else in America needs money? We need it, need it, need it, give me, give me, I need to borrow money, I need to borrow money. Corporations. Corporations, who else? Oh, what is it? Uh, Uncle Sam, yes. The government, y'all heard about the government deficit? Yeah. Like well, the government's borrowing money from from somebody. Who are they borrowing money from? You? Uh, me? No. They're taxing us, and so we don't have any money left over to lend it to them. But who has leftover money? American dollars. Other countries. Other countries. So what ends up happening is some of these. I'm just going to really put the evil spin on it. These Chinese businesses come up to the Chinese government and say. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mo. Mr. Chairman, we have these extra American dollars that we might each end have some kind of use for them or whatever kind of thing. Maybe the Chinese government buys them and gives them a few on so they can pay their workers. But whoever gets it lends it to the government by buying these government bonds that we talked about. It's IOUs for the signature and it's got Uncle Sam's signature on the bottom, so that's valuable. So they'll lend money to American businesses, they'll lend money to the American government. But then, if you owe money to somebody, you kind of have to pay attention when they start talking. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a fear, especially back in the 90s, when the first time when we got a big, huge honking deficit, there was worry that our deficit is going to get so big that foreign governments and foreign businesses are going to be so involved in what we do that we may end up losing control over, over our own government because our own government we're like well we can't declare war on China because we owe them so much money. Yeah, maybe. Or well okay, maybe not declare war but we cannot if we're having some kind of trade dispute thing if we're having some kind of trade dispute and there's some kind of you know, fighting over territorial waters off of the uh, coast of China and we have some kind of dispute you know, they could say, well, you either see things our way or, well, we're going to call off some of those loans and you got to, like, pay us back now. Or we'll stop lending to you and then see what you do because you can't fight our military. You can't fight us in a war if you can't pay your soldiers. Where are you going to get the money to pay the soldiers? Because you ain't getting up us anymore. There are some real-world potential issues there. Has any of it raised its ugly head yet? No. Not that we're aware. If it has, it's been small little, like, 
whatever, whatever thing, thing. But there's a potential issue there. Don't know that it's going to be a problem. We'll see. Um, China, I'm just using China because they're number one on this list. But China, could they say, well, screw America and burn us down to the ground, metaphorically, by screwing up our economy? By Yeah, because we owe a good chunk of our national government debt is owed to China. They could really screw up our economy. But if they screw up our economy, what are they also going to do? Screw up theirs. So it's still, so it would be a game of chicken. Who's going to fight fail first, us or them, if the serious, you know, let's, let's try to mess with them kind of thing happens. So they don't want to pick that fight. I'm a little bit surprised that we've had as much snipping as we have over this whole trade war thing thing that we've got going on these last few months. But so, it's in the grand scheme of things, that's just a little bit of snipping. And when the dust settles, we're just kind of like NAFTA. We had some snipping. We renegotiated a little bit when the dust settles. And most of the same rules apply, but we just have to figure out what we're doing with milk and the dairy industry. But otherwise, okay. And we move on. That's. That's my prediction for what will happen. Of course, the stock market will crash tomorrow. Does China's economy leave, leave the trade with uh, Russia? Yes. Uh, we do an interesting minor trade with Russia because Russia is no longer communist. So we're, we're fine with that. The Cuba? Not much better. So. <laughs> well, China, Russia's got their own other they, set of issues going on, mainly the. The Soviet Union was kind of controlled by the KGB, the heads of the KGB, the Politburo, a handful of rich folk that got rich skimming off of the economy. Well, then once the communism went over and they became privatized, whatever, well, those people kind of skimmed everything and now they have all the money. You now they're still the same people, but they're just under a different name. But on the right side, they domesticated the box, so Russia. Yes. <laughs> um, and I don't know what to do with that, but okay. Um, but Cuba, we don't trade with Cuba. Up until a couple of years ago, while Obama was in office, it was against the law to spend American dollars in Cuba. You go out, you decide you want to go on vacation to Cuba, well, you got to fly to Mexico, exchange your dollars for pesos, and you can go into Cuba and then do whatever you're going to do. But then they finally started opening things up. It's just a little in Cuba, right? But then they finally started opening things up, and then when President Trump got in office, he sort of shut the door on all of that. I honestly don't know where to stand now. But the motivation for international trade is comparative advantage. We talked about the second week of the semester. You have the advantage of having a lower opportunity cost than anybody else. So how can you take advantage of that? Just like in anything in life, if you have an advantage, you want to take advantage of that advantage. Choose better yourself. So Ultimately, you got to have more output, more production, and competitive advantage is the tool that you use. It's the ability. Where we talk, this is a refresher from chapter two. It's the ability to produce a specific good at lower opportunity cost than its trading partners. And going back to where we were at the end of class Tuesday, small countries are the ones that are most in need of doing this. They're most in the need of specializing because they usually don't have the ability to produce everything or a whole bunch of stuff. Go back to Haiti. It's a mountainous country with a lot of rocks and mountains and corrupt government. There ain't a whole lot that's going on there. So they don't need to be trying to grow their own tomatoes and make their own ice cream and grow their own bananas and all that kind of stuff. That's just trying to do too much. What they need to do is find a couple things that you're good at go all in and doing those things that you're good at and make money off of that that they can use buy everything else. That's what the Middle Eastern countries are doing. You know, I sort of say, you know, what, what, what do they have? Oil? Sand? That's pretty much it. So they're making all their money off of oil. They're not trying to grow all of the food and make all the clothes and build the cars, that kind of stuff. They're selling the oil, the one thing they have the advantage in, and they're making the money and they're using it to buy cars made elsewhere, clothes made elsewhere, food grown elsewhere. They're taking advantage of their competitive advantage. What happens if they run out of oil? I mean, they can't have oil. Uh, um, 100 years. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, we're buying this in time because we're doing our hydraulic fracking here in the United States. Frack, yeah. But, but yeah, when they run out, and that's the thing, when they run out, 
they, they got to be smart. They need to play the long game here. We're going to run out of oil. And before we even run out of oil, we're going to run out of customers for oil because if we can get less and less oil, what's going to happen to the price of oil? It's going to go up, 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 and people are going to say, screw that, there's going to be a cheaper way to do it. What happened when we had Hurricane Katrina and all that stuff and gas went up to $4 a gallon? That's when the hybrid cars started hitting, getting serious, and the electric cars would start getting serious. But what happens if oil spikes up that high again for a long amount of time? Okay. Yeah, yeah, people ask you for years, you're going back to driving your trucks and SUVs here in America, but we're going to be going back to battery power things. So 20, 30, 40 years ago, when gas is selling for $15 a gallon, yeah, there's still going to be oil in the ground, but everybody else would be like, screw that, I'm doing something different. So they need to say, well, we've got 100 years worth of oil, but we really only have about 50, 60 years worth of customer. So what we need to do is make as much money as we can during this last 50, 60 years, and don't just use it to buy more cars and buy more food. We need to use it to develop the next chapter in the story of our economy. They're trying to do things like getting into high tech, setting up another version of Silicon Valley where you get the computer programming and all that kind of stuff and chip designs and make all that kind of stuff. They're working on doing that kind of stuff. One thing to Israel is one of the leading countries in doing that kind of thing. The, the but that's what they gotta do is invest it in the next chapter. What is the next chapter going to be? But they need to do it while they have the opportunity now while they're bringing money in. Oh, <laughs> Terrible reminder. Uh, number one, just an example of what if you don't do it. Where I live, Henry County, Virginia, City of Martinsville, Martinsville Speedway, y'all know. 20 years ago, we had several furniture companies, several textile companies. You had people, you know the people that y'all went to school with graduate last week, last high school? You know those people? They were able to get jobs making $15, $16, $18 an hour working in the plant. With that little bit of education and that little bit of common sense, those people that you graduate last year, last high school with, that's what I'm doing with that there. But what ended up happening is because of NAFTA and labor unions, we lost most of the businesses. But during those, during those years, while things were really picking up, and the county's getting all this tax money. The economic planner should have been saying, well, this can't last. What's the next chapter in Henry County going to be? What's the next chapter in Pennsylvania County going to be? What's the next chapter for Marchville and Danville? And the next chapter was, I don't care. I'm just going to get mine and then retire. So we've got nothing. We have the highest unemployment rate. Henry County, Pittsburgh County, Marchville, Danville had the highest unemployment rate in the state. And we have the highest opioid addiction in the state. And we have a shrinking population. That's why you're working here. Yeah, and not there. Yes. Among other things, uh, it just I did some adjunct teaching with Patrick Henry Community College. It's only like 20 miles from my house. But I would take a full-time job there if they offered it to me because okay, yeah, I might have might, might be okay now, but five years from now, ten years from now, there might not be enough students to keep me afloat. So you got to plan for the next step. Oh, let's just try to remember what that other one was. That was a local example. I'm trying to do the international. Go with it in other direction, Mike. But here's a county that did what they were supposed to do. That's why I thought you were oh, going to. Well, no, no, they're, <laughs> they're totally, they're still doing, you know, they're doing, you got to keep an eye on the future. And, and you're counting. Because I say, the, who's on the town council in Martinsville? But the people that run furniture companies, textile companies. Our high school systems were geared to do what? Not to create people to go off to college, but to create people to go work for the plants. Yes, that's what we're shooting for. Was people there, the people that run the companies are in the government, and they're running the government school system to create employees for the businesses, for themselves. Same. So Remember when I said something place. about you need to pay attention to local elections the other day? Ding, 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 ding. Uh, 
And I can't remember, I cannot remember what the other story I wanted to say was. I'll come up with it. Okay. Yeah. We're going to take us a little mental journey for a couple of minutes. I'm going to give you a couple definitions, let you digest them. I'm going to give you an example that is kind of not related. But to help you understand, I'm going to draw a metaphor for it. Nominal, for you English people, what's the root word of nominal? What does this mean? In name, in name, name, what's the word name? Nominal GDP is what's the dollar amount of GDP? Real GDP, it ain't about how much money was made making stuff. Real GDP is how much stuff was made. Take the money out of it. Because as a company, which is better? This year we made 500 hammers, sold them for $20 each. Next year we made 500 cent hammers, sold them for $30 each. What happened? You made more money? Did you make more hammers? No. Did you create more jobs? No. Because you went from making 50 hammers to making 50 hammers. But what do we want as America? We need more than 50 hammers each year because we need more than we need more employees, we need more hammers, we need more food, right? So we try to bring it back. Instead of talking about how much money, we want to talk about how much stuff. Did we make more stuff this year than last year? Not did we make more money? Because you could have well, what happens if they made instead of what is it, 50 hammers? What if they made 20 hammers and sold them for hundred dollars a piece? They made more money at the end of the year, but what's happening in that company? They've lost two thirds of their sales, right? And so they're laying off workers because they're only selling for a third, third of the number of hammers they used to sell, right? So, nominal GDP is looking at the income of the country in terms of dollars, in terms of prices. Real GDP is we're going to be taking inflation out of the equation. So, here's the example. Jenny, congratulations. You didn't get hit with the door. We know that Jenny and Dr. Pepper have this thing. Jenny and Dr. Pepper are No, what is it? <laughs> what well, was it sitting in a tree? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> she got there sitting in a fire. She's locking the spider. Okay. Yes. Wow, that escalated quickly. Three <laughs> spiders, though. Oh, um, I look like a big dick, though. Anyway, um, okay. Jenny, let's see. Feel free to go, and it's I, right? Do it. There Okay. I'll misspell it. It says the word times for a semester cover. Okay. Um, feel free to like. How much money do you make a week? Um, a week? Probably like 300 Okay. Jenny makes $300 a week. Her. Jenny, the reason why she's working is to carry on her relationship with the doctor. Right now, Dr. Pepper sells for a dollar. Okay, we'll go with two dollars a piece. So, the Dr. Pepper is working is worth two dollars a piece. She's working for the Dr. Pepper. She ain't working for the money. We talked about that earlier. <laughs> she ain't working for the money. She's working for the stuff the money can buy her, and the only thing she buys is Dr. Pepper. Because she's a Dr. Pepper addict. So, what ends up happening? A week's paycheck for her now is enough money, $300, 200 bottles, that's enough for her to buy. Is it 150? Yes. Her paycheck, she's giving up all of her free time in her life for the week to get 150 bottles of. Dr. Pepper. Yes. <laughs> For the next six months until she ends up with a kidney stone the size of a golf ball. That's a hundred dollars a week. Jesus. Yes. Girls got to do what girls got to do. <laughs> what happens if <laughs> yes. next month things change? Jenny? Is now making three hundred twenty dollars a week. 
Paul says, Jenny, you're doing a good job, young lady. Let me give you a raise. Twenty dollars extra a week. Woo! She said, Wait, that never said away. Twenty five cents an hour, you jerk. <laughs> but unfortunately for her, Dr. Pepper has gone up in price to three dollars a bottle. So right now her paycheck is only enough for her to buy six. <laughs> 160 bottles. Nominally speaking, her income went up. Her paycheck went from 300 to 320. Right? The number on the front of her paycheck went up. But what happened to the quality of her life? It went up. Her real income went down. She went from making 150 bottles a week. And now she's only making 106 bottles a week. Well, technically, I guess it could, could have gone up. She's really unhealthy, drinking 150 a week. Yes. Okay, if you use her first quality of life, yes. But, okay. But where, you're assuming she's drinking it all, and not that she's like filling up her bad terms of face and winning in it. And it just, okay. I mean, that, that's why your ears are shining out. <laughs> but anyway, her real income is lower. I'm using the words income here, but it's the exact same thing going on for the country. I'm just using the word income here in GDP we measure this income. In a later chapter we will talk about nominal income, real income, it's the exact same thing as the example I gave here. So if we were talking about the Dr. Pepper company, what's happened to the Dr. Pepper company? Yeah, we raised our prices, but we're selling less. Um, the college is closing at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Yeah, we'll the next two. See you at Learning Hell at Little. This is going to work at two. Oh, yes, 2 o'clock today. Yeah, a lot of the, yeah, yeah, yeah I was going to ask if you knew the school system. Oh, the college is never closing at 1, so, yes. So I had to see like a Um, if you have a 130 class, swing by, see what the teacher says, the teacher. Well, I got 25 minutes, let me make the most of it. Your teacher might just say, get out of here because I'm scared and I got ball tires on the teeth and uh, I don't know what you think. Just say, think that was a test. But she, she very well, she bought the fact that we talked to this. She so, wasn't even here this morning and she still gave us a test. Yeah. So <laughs> even in a half hour instead of an hour and 20 minutes, she'd say, if she wouldn't give you a full test in 20 minutes, she'd take it well, 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 right, right in these places. Most of them did take it on that. Yeah, she go over a half hour one minute late. I have no idea what she's gonna do, but <laughs> we'll okay. So if your real income goes down, Jenny's worse off. If the country's real income goes down, we're worse off. If our real GDP's going up, we're making fewer bottles, making fewer hammers, making fewer chickens, assassinating fewer chickens. There's a chicken assassins out there. Less work is getting done, less jobs are needed. People get laid off. This is where you have unemployment, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, isn't the, uh, the, well, the most on the first few income, income is to make money? Yes. Yeah. To make more profit. Make profit, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, Dr. Pepper, you know, they, Dr. Pepper, they can't count on GDP to pay raises. They don't have to work by that. But they got to they. We talked about this in chapter three. Yeah. We raise our prices, we know we're gonna sell less. Which would raise we rather do? Sell 150 bottles at two dollars a piece or 102 bottles at three dollars a piece. Multiply oh, well, anything, or you can buy it somewhere in the middle. Or find it somewhere in the middle, find that perfect price. That's what we try to do. But of course, two at 150, that's 300, three, 306 is 318, but that's revenue, not profit, which is gonna be more profitable. All right. Make more money and do less work, I would say they would be happy with pay rate, pay the price. But, but it's possible for the next. Yeah, in this case, less supply shifting back to left. Yeah. Um, you can have scenarios, I honestly can't remember if I went there. I mean, we'll go to a couple of slides. Right now. Okay. Is it word? I'm sorry. Uh, you, do, do you want to see the store that they're closing the, the just, store for? Just be glad that you, my mom was listening. <laughs> you say that word. Sorry. Look, look, look at it. 
That's what's right next to us right now. Oh. <laughs> That's a lot, though. Like, what? Oh, it's, it's just tropical storm. I mean, you put me in a hurricane sometime last night and go like, right. so yes. I mean, still. Moving on. Oh, that's okay. Five, six, six. He's learning. Yeah, the problem now. I'm supposed to be telling you But it's kind of hard to do. It's the no, no, eyes are close. It's a skull. It's slightly turned. Right? I can see that. He's looking at the Anyway, uh, happy Halloween. Of course, yeah, I'm giving the test in one of my classes on Halloween for marketing. Uh, but visually, if you put we haven't talked about aggregate demand and aggregate supply yet. No. Okay, aggregate, aggregate. Did any of y'all know that word? Yeah. Oh, what? Altogether. Altogether, total. Aggregate supply. Everybody's supply for everything. Aggregate demand. Everybody's demand for everything. If we take all of our demands for everything, all of our supplies for everything, put them together, and we will get. Everything is getting made in the country. Everything is getting bought in the country. This is why C plus I plus G plus X gives you the same number as that rent, wages, income, interest, all that crap, right? Also, will determine the price level in the country. But we want to make sure, we don't just want to make more money, we want to make sure that we're making more jobs and getting more stuff. So this is what you end up getting with real GDP here. This is just you digital errors. Here we go. Uh, not going to play with it, but guess what happens if you get a shift in demand? Prices go up, more stuff gets made. Woohoo! All that stuff from chapter three. But it's going to be on the test next week, right? Shift is one of your first time. Yeah. The real GDP is showing the work is getting done, not the money that's made. What we did for Jenny is we did we converted from dollars to Dr. Peppers. That's showing the work that got done. But we can't just talk about Dr. Peppers because there's some of you on your classroom don't drink Dr. Pepper, right? And there's some of us here in this classroom who don't work for Dr. Pepper Incorporated, right? So what we ultimately really don't get lost in the weeds here, we will revisit this later. What we really do is we look at the prices of a basket of goods, quote unquote. We'll take, you know, what's the price of jeans, the price of cars, the price of Dr. Pepper, the price of a hamburger, the price of a t shirt. They'll bundle it together and they'll say, how much did that stuff cost this year? How much did it cost last year? And that's how they calculate what the inflation rate is. And what they do is they'll calculate back in time, they, they'll pick this base year that we're going to compare to. And then when they're trying to compute the GDP, they can say, okay, we did $19 trillion worth of stuff. Well, let's convert that $19 trillion worth of stuff in $2018 into what would it cost to buy that same amount of stuff in the whatever year, 2010 or whatever that index year is. So you remove inflation from it. Because it might happen. A bit. The, the example I use: What if the hammer company raised their price to hundred dollars a hammer? They're not going to sell anywhere near as many of them. The amount that gets made is a lot lower, but the total amount of money might be higher. So you have you you're masking something brutal going on in the economy. A lot of hammer makers' jobs are going away, right? And it's hidden by the fact that the company's actually bringing in more money. Yay to them. But we're worried about jobs, job creation, job growth, and that kind of thing. So you're saying if they buy more of that basket, we're going to go one way from the inflation. They buy less from the inflation. Well, not, not exactly, but I'm going to say that we have an entire chapter coming up soon about inflation. But uh, we really didn't even go there. But the point is, if we want to take out, oh, did the company make more money this year because we raised our prices? Or did we make more money this year because we did more, we sold more products? Hopefully, we like to be raising our, making more of our product. And so then we're not losing customers in that case, right? 
So that's kind of what we're looking at there. It's how much work is getting done. So we're converting, taking that inflation out of the way. If prices are three percent higher this year than last year, well, hopefully our sales numbers grew by more than three percent. Or else I suggest that we made less this year. We sold less items this year than we did last year. So the base period, you're going to come up with what time period are you going to compare with? And then you compare from there. The definition here is you take whatever your price index is and you divide it by divide the knowledge you mean by that. 99% sure I'm not going to have you do that on the test, so there you go. <laughs> but I'm getting, dipping my toes in the surf of inflation, but we're going to get to that in chapter 9, which is a couple chapters from now. But what is inflation? An increase in the average level of prices of goods and services. Not just one product. Gas goes up. That ain't inflation. It happens. Gas goes up one week, down one week. Gas price go up for milk. It happens. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. Milk might go up, orange juice goes down, that ain't inflation. If the average level of everything is going up, that's inflation. And it ain't just going up once, it's going up over a period of time. And like I say, which I'm sure I have it on the next slide here, now I have, uh, okay. uh, I have an example here, so ignore this for a second. Uh, what we do is we don't look at everything because it's insane to look at the price of everything and try to add it up. So we look at that basket of goods, look at what happened to the prices of 100 items or so. And does it cost more to buy that same 100 items this year than it did last year? That's how you compare. It's like if any of you ever gone in Food Lion and checked out the price of a half a dozen items, gone in Walmart and checked out the price of the same half a dozen items to see which store is cheaper. That's how you find out which store is cheaper. You can't look at the Walmart brand soap and the Food Lion brand beer. No, you got to look at the exact same products from one store to the next to see which is cheaper. You do the same thing from one year to the next to measure the GDP. My transition, I kind of, it got broke when I switched to Google Slides, but okay. Here's the example. This company, okay, we're making a $5 item. What do we want to make? I think it sells for about $5, $6. Tires. 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 Even if I can't achieve a tire to that. Headphones. Cheap headphones. So cheap earbuds. Okay. What's wrong? Cheap. What? Oh, no. What was it? The, 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 the pop socket thing that the kids are putting oh, on? Oh, God. Yes. My sister put one on my phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you said that. Sure. It's shaped like Dr. Pepper. No, okay. That's okay, so yeah. pop socket. In 2016, the company made a thousand of them at five dollars each. The company brought in five thousand dollars selling pop sockets. Good for them. In 2017, they made a thousand of them at six dollars a piece. They went from bringing in five thousand dollars and now they're bringing in six thousand dollars. But what happened? The only thing that happened, the only thing that changed, was the sticker they put on the front of the box. They didn't do any more work. They want any more pop sockets being done. They brought in more money, but they went from making a thousand pop sockets to making a thousand pop sockets. So this change was nominal only. The gain came only from the price change. No extra work got done. What happened? It, uh, give me five seconds to talk about that. This would be okay. The price, the price of Dr. Pepper went from two dollars to three dollars. The Jenny's paycheck goes from three dollars, I mean three hundred dollars a week to four hundred fifty dollars a week. She went from making enough money to buy one hundred fifty sodas to making enough money to buy one hundred fifty sodas. Does her life change? No, she's in the exact same situation. Though the numbers on the price tags are different, the numbers on her paycheck are different. Her life is exactly the same. That's what we're talking about here in this example here. So, good question. Can, um, can they make more pies if the pies were frozen at the same time? We're getting there. All they in universe number one. Spock is the captain of the Enterprise. It wasn't that the way those were. Okay. They went from making a thousand of them five dollars a peach to peach. <laughs> yeah, they're peach coach. <laughs> uh, to this year, that 2017, they made 
1,100 of them kept the price the same. In this case, they made more money. Why? Not from raising the price artificially. They made more money because they made more pop sockets. So in this case, we have a real change. More items were produced, more jobs getting created because we need that many more workers to make that extra 100 more pop sockets. Right. Okay. Alternate universe number two. Sulu is the captain of the Enterprise. Wait, you let McCoy over here help. Okay. So they went from making 100 of them, five dollars each, to this year they only sold made and sold 800 of them. But they raised their price to six and a quarter. So what happened? They went from bringing in five thousand dollars to bringing in five thousand dollars. But what's happening? People are buying less, workers are losing their jobs. But you may not see that because if you're just looking at well, what's happening in the economy, well, this is what making five thousand, making five thousand. So revenue didn't change, but fewer items were produced. So you have the nominal change in price, but you don't have a nominal change in income. It went from five thousand to five thousand, but you had a real change in production a thousand. Dropping down to 800. Okay. Now, Chekhov is in charge of the enterprise. Went from making $1,005 a piece to making $800, and they raised the price to $7 a piece. They made more money for $5,000 $5, but not because they did more work. They ended up doing less work, but they so jacked your price up. That you know the managers of the company are like, woohoo, we made more money, you need bonus. And they're hoping that nobody notices that they lost 20% of their customers. And this is not as way to pay them, right? Because if you lose 20% of your customers, no problem. In this case, the extreme price increase is gonna hide that lower production. What would be beautiful, I don't have the example. I think what Sam was suggesting about would be fantastic if they raise their price at the same time they were able to make it sell more. So 12 times 7 is 7, 14. Oh, no. uh, eight. Yeah, it's four. Woohoo! More money, but they were okay because we raised our prices and we sold more. What happens? We created more demand here. People have become addicted to pop sockets, right? The word came out of pop sockets cure cancer, something like that, right? Steam pop sockets. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I guess it's blocking some of the radioactivity coming out of the backside of your phone or whatever. So thank you, thank you. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Y'all too young to remember all of that, but tell me. Oh, yeah, no, I still hear it. Yeah, with me on all that. Okay. Um, yeah, all right. Seems like there's one other thing. Okay, let's see. No, I already did that example, so never mind. Um, yes, I live early. I know y'all are like, dude, but I'm like, I'm so far sticking behind. I can't talk. 